Hi there. This is Walking DD with the Doolittle Raid. Everybody will know of the Pearl Harbor, the attack by the Japanese that brought the US into the Second World War. Fewer will have heard of the Doolittle Raid. This was the most audacious mission of World War II. Audacious because on the face of it, it had zero chance of success. Of the nine battleships of the Pacific Fleet, eight were present in Pearl Harbor, two were lost during the raid, and the other six were badly damaged but refurbished in the following months. The three aircraft carriers were fortunately elsewhere. That fact allowed the Doolittle raid to be hatched. At the same time as Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attacked the Philippines and the British Empire in Malaysia, Singapore and Hong Kong. Pearl Harbor attack left the US in shock and wanting revenge. But how? On December the 21st, Roosevelt spoke to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the White House. He said they should bomb Japan as soon as possible to boost morale and show the Japanese they weren't immune to attack. Easier said than done. The US had no bomber that could fly the 5,000 miles to Japan and on to China. Captain Francis S. Lowe of the US Navy suggested that twin-engine bombers could take off from an aircraft carrier. He came to this idea after seeing bombers taken off from Norfolk Chambers Field Naval Station, where they had the outline of an aircraft carrier painted on the runway. Colonel Doolittle was a test pilot and aeronautic engineer. He was given the task of putting the plan into operation. The planes used would need a range of 2,800 miles with a 2,000 pound bomb load. B-25 was chosen. The B-23 was considered but had a 50% greater wingspan which reduced the number of aircraft carried and risked damaging the superstructure of the carrier. The B-26 was rejected due to the takeoff characteristics. When the B-25 was chosen, two were loaded into the USS Hornet and flown off the deck with no problem. The pilots who did this weren't part of the raiding force. The raid was now approved and 17th Bomb Group chosen to supply crews. The B-25 only had a range of 1,300 miles, so extra fuel tanks had to be added to double the range. Other modifications were made to increase the range. The lower gun turret was removed and a fake gun turret was placed in the tail. The liaison radio was moved and the Norden bomb maimer replaced with one that cost $2. Two bombers did have cameras added to record the raid. Doolittle had wanted to land in the Soviet Union as it was closer, but the Russians had signed a pact of neutrality with Japan. Chiang Kai-shek gave permission to land in China, even though they were worried about reprisals. The 17th bomb group was moved to South Carolina on the East Coast to prepare for the mission. The crews were then given the opportunity to volunteer for an unspecified and hazardous mission. From the 1st of March 42, the 20 selected crews now had three weeks to train in short takeoffs, night flying, low flying, and low altitude bombing. On the 25th of March, 22 B 25s flew west to California. On the 31st, 16 were loaded onto USS Hornet. Normally, planes on an aircraft carrier are stowed in the hold and brought up when needed. The bombers can go in the hold, so all 16 had to be on the deck, reducing further the length of the runway. The Japanese spies no doubt saw these bombers on the Hornet. They couldn't imagine they were being moved towards Japan. The Hornet sailed west towards Japan. It was only now that the crews were told of their intended target. They realised what the market on the ground during their training represented. A few days later they met with the Task Force 16 near Hawaii. The Task Force was now made up of two aircraft carriers, the Hornet and the Enterprise, four cruisers, eight destroyers and two oilers. On the 17th of April the oilers refuelled the Task Force then withdrew east with the destroyers, while the carriers and cruisers sped westwards at 20 knots. The next day they were spotted by a Japanese patrol boat. It was sunk by the USS Nashville. The captains committed suicide 
rather than be picked up, but they took five of the Evan crew prisoners. survivors. It is feared they have flashed the news to heavy Jap naval forces in the vicinity. Survivors are picked up and brought aboard. It was assumed that the patrol boat had sent a signal about their presence. Vice Admiral William Halsey, who commanded the task force, decided to launch the bombers, even though they were 200 miles short of the intended launching site. With the task force being discovered, Halsey couldn't risk his ships. He needed his fighters up on the deck. To bring them up, the deck had to be clear of the bombers. So they had to take off or be pushed into the sea. Now this was the first time the pilots had taken off from an aircraft carrier. Doolittle went first and all the planes took off successfully, even though the sea was turning rough. Six hours later, they came over Japan. They had several military targets, some were in Tokyo, and others were in Yokohama, Nagoya and Osaka. The bombers over Tokyo had strict instructions not to bomb the Emperor's palace. They came under the light anti-aircraft fire and were attacked by planes. None of the bombers were shot down, three fighters were shot down. The fake guns in the tail seemed to be effective as no planes attacked from the rear. The Japanese civilians didn't panic. They had been realistic air raid drills just before. The plan had been to land in China on marked zones, then refuel and take off again to continue to Chongqing. Having taken off 200 miles early, they didn't have enough fuel to get to the planned landing sites. Luck was on their side and they had a 25 knot tailwind. They still didn't have enough fuel to get to the landing sites, but without the tailwind they would have ditched in the sea. Fifteen planes reached China. The crews either bailed out or crashed landed. One man was killed when he bailed out. Doolittle decided they must abandon the ship. He told the crew to jump, then he put the plane on autopilot, checked that everybody had gone and then jumped. He was worried about breaking an ankle and had a soft landing in a paddy field. He spent the night in a crate he found in a shack. It was a coffin with a body in it. The next day he was found by suspicious Chinese soldiers. They thought he was a spy until they found his parachute. It took him a week to find his crew. Then he was taken to Chongqing, where he met Madame Chiang Kai-shek. The plane of Captain Edward York went to Russia. He knew they were low on fuel and couldn't get to China. The plane was impounded and the men interned. In May 43 they were allowed to cross the border into Iran. The official story was they'd bribed somebody to help them escape. Two planes were unaccounted for. Two men died when their plane crashed into the sea. Others were captured by the Japanese. Three of the men were executed. Of the 80 crew members who took part, 69 got back to the US. The Japanese retaliated by massacring 250,000 Chinese. Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle was sure he would be court-martialed as all the aircraft had been lost and 16 tons of bombs hadn't caused much damage. He didn't realise the boost to morale that the raid had provoked. There were celebrations in the streets. He was promoted to Brigadier General while he was still in China and received the Medal of Honor from Roosevelt. The raid had further positive repercussions. The Japanese high command had bragged that their islands were impregnable. They were humiliated. Admiral Yamamoto developed plans for a major naval victory by attacking the US fleet at Midway. Midway would be a good base for the Japanese to harass Hawaii. They didn't know that the Americas had broken their code and were ready for them. 
Midway was a crushing defeat for the Japanese Navy. The raid also prompted the Japanese to divert resources into holding China and kept more aircraft to defend the homeland. Thanks for watching to the end. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe or tap like, ask questions, or you can support the channel through Patreon.